the Fed comes in and he goes, Ta-da! Boom! Magic! We solved it. QE. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, QE is it's just circus. It's just language. It's propaganda. It's the Fed going, hey, I'm doing something. I'm over here. Uh, yeah, I'm Kim Kardashian. Uh, don't understand money, but, you know, I tell a good story. You folks all watch. I've, I've got this thing. I've just made it up. It's called quantitative easing. Japan's been doing it. Oh, right. Okay. Well, Japan's been doing it. Yeah, they've been doing it. Well, how's that working out? Well, you know. Hugh Hendry, welcome to the show. And thank you for making some time. Always got time for inquisitive minds. <laughs> I appreciate that. So before we dive into really your thesis about where the economy is heading, I'd love to learn the story of Hugh Hendry. What was Hugh's upbringing like and how did you get involved in financial markets? Uh, yeah, my father delivered milk to schools and had to get up and leave very early in the morning, leaving behind his young wife and two young children. Um, and she, my mum, God help her, she picked up a lot of bad behavior from bad neighbors. And, you know, she was on diazepam and eesh, horrible. Um, the day Elvis died. We got the keys to a new gold dream, um, a new idea, and, and urban, uh, re, urban re, reimagined lots of green space. Uh, and so we moved to another project, a nicer project. And then it coincided with the, the political eco economy and the, the kind of revolution from Thatcher and Reagan et al. But in the UK, um, you got the government granted the right for the, the poor folk to buy the housing stock, you know, the, the social housing stock. You could buy it, that kind of broken windows thesis. If people own things, they might take more care. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was, I was looking at a chart comparing Canadian house prices uh, to US house prices. Blink, hell, what's going on in Canada? I mean, like, yeah. you know, but yeah. well, back back then, so 1980, um, you know, poor folk didn't buy houses. Um, and so that was all part of the revolution. And my parents got a mortgage. But I have to say, you know, they they were they were a type that, that worried about stuff. You know, they were kind of righteous people trying to do the right thing. And it blew their brains out to think they had a mortgage. Um, and I think some of that worry um, rubbed off on me. I think I am, if anything, I am a world-class warrior. Um, but anyway, you know, blah, blah. Um, my force of character and, and serendipity, and maybe force of character um, is like a beacon to serendipity, but a few kind of fortunate twists and turns uh, saw me at university saw me rejecting a career in accountancy um, saw me studying market-based accounting research. So I was given access to a, a, you know, a price terminal to try and investigate and determine whether um, stock price, price CDs actually were embedded were, with rational information. You know, so like you, you were testing a, a hypothesis of a change in, a, in accounting. Um, and under one scenario, it would have both scenarios affect, affected earnings. One scenario would not affect um, cash flow. Could the market determine the difference? Clearly, uh, a superficial change in earnings, either higher or lower, uh, with no disruption to the cash flow, the market value should remain the same. So that was my first insight into kind of looking at stock prices. And I was quite fascinated by that. I've always been. Uh, somewhat different from everyone else. You know, I went to university, I didn't drink, didn't have girlfriends, didn't smoke, didn't party, just worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I saw things. Um, and then I, I thought, yeah, I like this, this market thing. And again, serendipity lent a hand. And I got a position with a, a wonderful uh, pension fund manager, Bailey Gifford, in Edinburgh a long time ago. Um, and I was there for eight years and I received a wonderful education, a kind of bottom up, breaking stocks down, very concentrated portfolios and a lot of geographical uh, debate in terms of uh, equity weightings around the world, 
which uh, lent heavily on a kind of macro analysis. Uh, mm. Every week, um, there would be a presentation on one of the, the, the principal pillars of the global economy. Um, I, I would be called upon once a month to, to participate and make a paper. So that was early grounding in, in macro. Um, I, the eight years that I spent um, received a lot of information, could not monetize it. Uh, the nature of the investment process did not uh, rest kindly on my shoulders. Um, and, and for some reason, I always had a very strong sense of, of change, um, but I was ill-equipped to monetize that within that paradigm that they were pursuing. Um, and yet change would come mm -hmm. and I would be ignored and so I'd get kind of restless and I'd be agi yeah, I was an agitator. And that was regarded as me being a troublemaker. Um, so I was going nowhere. Anyway, um, I got to London and, and I met with Chris Benodi. Um, and I, I became a principal portfolio manager there and, you know, uh, a partner. And uh, initially, I looked after the, the European Mutual Fund, and I I was a, a safe shepherd. Uh, I took it on the final year, if you will, of the Nasdaq bubble. But more importantly, um, I I fully protected the capital value in the two following years when you know the German stock market lost eighty percent of its value, and all my peer group lost lost money. Um, and that was the catapult for me launching a hedge fund, which I did within OD. And then in 2005, I purchased that uh, management contract and, and I launched my own business, Eclectica. Uh, I ran that for 15 years from 2002 to 2017. And that was a portfolio which was obtuse. It was a portfolio that was uh, that perhaps owing to the architect, owing to the author of the fund, me, um, it just uh, didn't rhyme with anything else in the financial universe. So my correlation was non-existent to anyone else. And, and that was a powerful force of diversification. And so I was able to accumulate upwards of over a billion dollars in, in pension mandates, which were looking to invest in that sector. And I was a diversifier. Um, and I enjoyed, again, serendipity um, and hard work. I caught the emergence of the, the gold bull market in 2003, I had a 50% return. And then five years later, I had a 30 odd percent return when I profited, I, I f foresaw uh, the storm clouds and the financial bankruptcy of the global banking sector. So that's my story. Awesome. What was your best day on Wall Street? When you think back to those days, what was that one day where everything just lined up? Well, there are no such days. Um, but, you know, to, like, you know, 99.9% .9 of the days are um, uh, full of self-loathing uh, and, and frustration. And that was certainly very much the case between May 2007 and October 2008. So I conceived, I knew about, you know, um, the... I knew, and indeed, I had initially I had the position on the um, the mortgage-backed securities, you know, the shorting mm -hmm. of the the credit protection, um, and, th and that was April of two thousand and seven. So, you know, all the characters from the Big Short. I mean, you know, I know those. I know the principal architects of that, um, and I would have been the principal fund having those positions in London. So, to answer your question, my best monetary day was the Monday morning following. The Sunday evening announcement of Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, um, and but but that felt like one second to midnight. You know, for for over a year, I had been like pushing this ball up a hill. It kept rolling down. I kept pushing it up. Kept rolling down in terms of the obstinacy of the market's enthusiasm for like shallow recession, soft landings, and all that nonsense. Um, and you know, one would have hoped, you know, you think, Hey, I'm just, I'm going to make money. I'm going to make money. I'm going to make money. I made, I made money. I lost money. I made money. I lost money. And I just lost money, lost money, lost money, lost money. Mm -hmm. And then 
just as the clock was about to announce my extinction. Lehman's beat me to it, and I, you know, I made two hundred million dollars for the for the clients. So was that my best day? I, was that my best? I mean, to find best, it was a it was a profound relief. Yeah. Um, but I think that would perhaps, and you know, in 2003, when I made 50% in gold, that wasn't fun. Um, I had heavens, about a 15, 20% drawdown. It's my first calendar year. The majority of hedge funds fail in the first year. Um, mm -hmm. with that kind of drawdown, I was thinking I was dead. Right. Your first year, find something which is trending in a high volatility trend and you you load up and you hang on. And that's when yeah. gold was that instrument. Gold was the Bitcoin of 2003. And, um, and again, it was arduous. And there were many days where I thought I was kaput. Um, but I guess there were, um, I, I think the turn for me would have been around um, April, May, June. And I think that those three months I went, you know, 20, 20, 20 or something on the upside. So Right on. Um, so I, I don't really, I kind of push back on the notion of best days. Uh, most mm -hmm. days when you're, I guess, a contrarian fund um, are lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a question of survival. What does that feel like when you're able to, you mentioned you made $200 million um, on the collapse of Lehman. How does, what does that feel like when you forecast the storm clouds, you see them coming, and then it finally happens and you make your profit, but at the same time that you're profiting, kind of the world is going to, you know, not the best place at the time. How does that, does that take away from the sweetness of the win? Um, I mean, you know, that, that, that's my business, you know, the, um, the miserable business of procrastinating the future. Um, and the, the, the profound frustration was that, uh, the truth tellers, the people who actually could see these events like myself and you know, and others, but not many others, mm -hmm. um, were deemed to be outlaws. You know, we had uh, bans on short selling. No one. There are times when the truth is so overwhelmingly terrible, and to policymakers, terrible news is where it almost engulfs them and it makes mm -hmm. them feel powerless, and they want to lash out. And the last thing they want to hear is the truth. They want to keep pushing the truth away. Um, so, you know, there was a kind of sticking it to the man that actually we, we had prevailed and I actually wasted a year or so of representing the hedge fund industry against this evil caricature, you know, these, these people who only profit from the misery of others. Actually, if policymakers had been attentive, um, to what we could see in the with our independent objective analysis, we were reading the same data. I mean, I'm seeing the same data as the Federal Reserve today, and I, I'm at a loss. I mean, you know, we we employ so you know, we, we employ the Kardashians to set interest rates. You know, we don't we don't employ people who understand money to set interest rates, and indeed we don't need it because the people who do understand money set interest rates in the bond market. That's why we have it, and and when views differ. We get an, an inversion between the twos and the 10. You know, the 10 year refuses to trade at the yields prevailing at the short end. Um, so, um, but to your point, I mean, it was very stark because there was, yeah, and I was, yeah, I've happily exalted that I'd survived, mm -hmm. exalted that I'd have um, another day to do something which I enjoy. Absolutely. I recall taking my, my young daughters. It's a very down expensive private London school that was full of celebs, you know, the David Beckhams of this world and supermodels, and, you know, it's kind of my world. Um, and, but also, um, there were, there were a lot of parents that would be, would have been partners at Lehman Brothers. And I tell you, that thing was a cult, it was a belief system. And they, they never, they never sold anything on the way down. And so to your point, my ecstasy did flash at the school steps and seeing the profound misery that welcomed me. You know, seeing people whose lives had, it seemed had fundamentally changed for the worse. Mm -hmm. And so that was certainly, that was, um, I had to go and get a coffee and a chocolate croissant and think that over. And you've alluded to this a couple of times, Hugh. What correlations and what similarities are you seeing today 
compared to what you saw back in 2005, six, seven, eight, leading up to the big, the big crash. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, let's put the sunny disposition and let's go for the, the, the thing that's glaringly not the same. And the thing which is, is good. And the thing which is, um, is making this journey protracted. And I have to say, so I talk in the language of time. Um, macro is again, procrastinating over, um, intervals of time and, and the proponents of it who are skillful recognize that in the macro environment, things change very, very slowly. You know, the U S economy is $25 trillion and it doesn't grind to halt immediately. Yeah. And so typically you'll find that we're trying to underwrite. We're seeking to achieve a profit over a period of two years. Okay. So I, I put on positions, um, or advised positions from about March of this year mm -hmm. with zero expectation that I'd make money in March or April or May modest, modest notion that I might make money this year. So, you know, within macro, I can't even tell you the year. I can't tell you if it's 23 or 24, but I can tell you, um, it, it, it most likely will not be longer than that. Uh, so, uh, so time, um, so why is this again? Why is it, if any ball drops, why is it going to drop later? And the good news is that in the U S, um, the household sector transfers the mortgage rate risk, the risk from variances and in interest rates from the fed intervening and changing rates. And my goodness, uh, the fed has, this is uh, the biggest intervention in the feds history, you know, uh, 450 basis points in 12 months um, is rapid and the magnitude is is beyond. Well, uh, I love what you say because this is just like the 80s, essentially, when you adjust for debt to GDP, where interest rates were technically nominally much higher back in the 80s and the Volcker days. But when you adjust for the amount of debt that's in the system today and multiply it out by the 5.25, we're right, right at that same level. Yeah, we, we are. But what I'm saying to you is that, you know, during the pandemic, uh, the 10 year rates traded below 50 basis points. The 30 year came very low and the, the majority of the U S mortgage debt was refinanced at rates between two and 3% and they're fixed now for 30 years. Okay. So the fed hiking rates has not created impairment in the household sector. And I'm glad of that. That's a good thing. Um, now, a risk transferred is not a risk that disappears. Okay. Right. Uh, and so one of my concerns is that the financial sector, you know, accepted 30 year rates at these uh, at levels which have proven in, you know, you know, the reality is, is, has proven very challenging. And so there's a profound mark to market loss residing in the financial sector. We saw that we saw its emergence with the initial bankruptcies in the regional bank sector, where they had um, um, they had portfolios called hold to maturity where, um, you could, you could be sitting there with large unreal, unrealized losses. Um, but the regulator, namely the fed did not, did not require you to pass those losses through your PL. Um, but what happened again was that the rapidity of the feds rate hikes actually started dominoes falling and, and people obviously with the invention of telephone banking, you could transfer funds away. And so it was actually f f deposit flight, which meant that it was necessary to realize hold to maturity portfolios. And at that point, these, these businesses were insolvent. Mm -hmm. The fed wants you to tell you, oh, we solved that, but you know, they didn't, they've hidden it under the carpet, you know, to this day, you know, major institutions like bank of America. Um, but you know, they've. They, at their annual year results, they confessed to having about a hundred million dollars, a hundred billion dollars in unrealized losses. That'd be about 37% of their book equity. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had quarterly earnings. Do you think any financial journalist at the meeting goes, I've got a question, excuse me. I'm just thinking, could you, could you give us an update on the, on the, where are you with your unrealized losses? Does anyone ask that? Anyone ask that? 
No. 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 You know, quarterly earnings are an exercise in boosterism. You know, uh, Citigroup. So first quarter, second quarter. First quarter, we have unprecedented bankruptcies of major, major deposit, major asset banks. You know, historically, the banks that failed were big. And quarter to quarter, the provision for loan losses increases by two basis points. They can get away with anything. We're in presently. Anyway, to answer your question, parallels, uh, a, a, a parallel which is strikingly different is the uh, the household sector has been um, saved, if you will, the agony of the higher rates. Um, I think mortgage interest rate payments have halved um, today versus 2008. So that's a good thing. Uh, the bad thing would be that those those there are unrealized losses and they are really now beginning to affect the dissemination, the spreading of credit. Credit is money printing. We live in a world where people don't understand money. Money is not being printed, um, almost the reverse. And, and, and in due course, one would anticipate that the, to my mind, we're in a transition from um, a very high uh, rate of change in prices, which was necessary uh, because, you know, uh, fiscal policy, um, increased demand at a time when the industrial capacity of the world was closed owing to the pandemic. And so price had to, to bear the, the load. And of course you had Ukraine. Um, that's unwinding. I can say that confidently. I can say it very confidently because global uh, producer prices, if you want to know where CPI is in six months time, look at, look at producer prices today. Um, the U S is 0.1% year over year. Uh, today, the nation of Finland, you know, um, I must look up what Finland does these days. Forestry, of course, and other things. Um, but producer, producer prices are falling 9.5% year over year uh, in Finland. Um, and we know that China's slowing down. We know that um, exports from these massive manu global manufacturing hubs out of China, Taiwan, South Korea. And we're talking about 25% declines year over year. In, in exports into the US. So um, the we're destocking and, and so I'd anticipate a slowdown. Yeah. And I want to get your thoughts on the state of the current economy and where we're going. But before we dive into that, you talk a lot about the silent depression that the United States has been in since 2008, 2009. In your opinion, what fundamentally broke in the economy during the great financial crisis? A, a, a willingness on the part of the financial sector um, to take on risk. So first of all, I must give great credit to the wonderful Emil Galiofsky, uh, who who was the who co-sponsored initially the Euro Dollar University podcast with uh, the wonderful Jesus Jeff Snyder. Um, it's essential weekly listening for everyone, everyone that has a desire to understand uh, macro, um, and. And so what we're looking at, and then courtesy of Matt Klein, at Klein Matt, or at Klein, I don't know, but he's on Twitter, and he's co-author of the wonderful book, um, um, Trade Wars Are Class Wars by the incredible mind, which is Professor Michael Pettis. Um, and, and he tweeted, he has a sub stack, and he had a chart which shows you per, per capita GDP so average incomes, the, the average income of the average person in America. And from 1930 to 1945, that series went from a base, an index of 100 to 180. And today, here we are, 2008 to the present, so similar length of time. And we're tracking not at 180, we're tracking at 118. Mm -hmm. We're... So hugely behind, off. and they tell us the Great Depression was was great and depressing. So what do we call the silent? It's worse if you look at the UK. I mean, it's declining. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it, the series is flat, and you're getting immigration, um, and so it's declining on a per capita basis. I mean, in the last fifteen years, Europe has largely stagnated, and the US economy has almost doubled. I mean, there's a profound issue in, going on in uh, in Europe. 
I think that issue is spreading into China. Um, and, and the commonality is both of those economies are highly dependent on uh, global ex exports, like more than 50% of their GDP. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, you know, why is this happening? Um, we have an, an invisible electronic ledger, which exists offshore, um, run by all the major principal banks in the world. Um, and they create dollars. They print money. They print money overnight. You, you, you present collateral. They, typically, they prefer if you present a treasury bill. But if you have a billion dollars in treasuries, they will give you a billion dollars in overnight cash. So that's new cash that didn't exist before. And that's um, the euro dollar system, which Jeff Snyder talks about in depth, right? It is. Yeah, it is. Um, that system has lost its desire. It's mm -hmm. lost its mojo. You, you, what did you have? You had banking regulation. Uh, you had regulation on bonuses, uh, investigations, ch charge sheets against you know risk uh, participants. Um, you know, society you know has determined that they don't like banks, and so the banks are like, well, you know, there's less and less incentive for me uh, to to take career changing risks. Maybe that's a good thing in the long run, but in the short term. Um, there's less credit creation and cr credit money is oxygen. And if you supply less of it, it gets harder to speak. Right. So because of the GFC, society got a little bit more risk averse and a lot of all the blame was put on the banks, probably rightfully so. So in order to prevent that from happening and that risk aversion, are you saying that there shouldn't have been additional regulation and compliance requirements for banks and as a society we would just have to tolerate these massive booms and then the massive busts uh, i think what i'm mostly what i'm saying is um I'm, I'm tired of the obfuscation it'd be better if the fed went oh, this, oh, this is hard you know it's morally it's complex you know we have to punish you you know you 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 know you buggers went bust but okay, well, hold on a second. I was the regulator and I'm supposed to be ahead of the events. I mean, I saw it, but, but the regulator didn't see it. The banks didn't see it. They went down. It's complicated. Um, but the objection is the Fed comes in and goes, ta -da! boom, magic, we solved it. QE. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now QE is it's just circus. It's just language. It's propaganda. Is the Fed going, hey, I'm doing something. I'm over here. Uh, yeah, I'm Kim Kardashian. Uh, don't understand money, but you know, I tell a good story. You folks all watch. I've got this thing. I just made it up. It's called quantitative easing. Japan's been doing it. Oh, right. Okay. Well, Japan's been doing it. Yeah, they've been doing it. Well, how's that working out? Well, you know, they're still figuring it out. They're on their 27th attempt to get it right. Oh, I'm thinking red flag. Okay, yeah, Federal Reserve. What is quantitative easing? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, we we buy government bonds. Wow, and and even at the Federal Reserve, like there was a there was a Federal Board meeting where one of the the stooges went. I've been reading some some textbooks about central banking, and there was this guy in the nineteenth century in London. He's called Walter Backhot, and he created this this rule. It was a really dope rule, and apparently. We're meant to pursue it. And the notion is that we step in to the breach of a crisis and we provide liquidity and we buy things. We're the only ones that can buy and we buy good assets that are selling at distress levels. And our intervention resolves the situation and the, and the fears and the anxiety all come down. Mm -hmm. So but principle to that is, we buy the things that no one else can dare buy. And again, what I want to say to you is every, everyone, not everyone, but you know, knowledgeable macro people can quote uh, the great professor um, uh, Milton Friedman, monetary uh, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. But actually, that I mean, that is true. But it's also everywhere, all, all, everywhere, everywhere and at all times, it's a psychological phenomenon. And so the bank has received a boost in its assets. So reserve pays very, it pays very little. Now it's really pretty cool. But back then, 
And so the thinking of quantitative easing is the bank's going to go, this asset, let's swap this asset, let's sell this asset and, and make a new loan. Now we're printing money. Or they might say, hey, let's sell this asset and buy treasuries. But you know, like treasuries was sitting, you know, 10 year was sitting at 50 basis points in 2021. So, you, but they, they didn't make new loans. And that's where QE, uh, that's, that's why Japan's on the 27th iteration because you can lead a, a horse to water, right? You can give it the bank yeah. reserves, but you can't make it drink the water. You can't make it suck down the straw of the Kool-Aid and make new loans. QE has been a profound disappointment in changing the risk assessment of the banks. Okay. So to recap, and I might butcher this summary, but what you're saying is that banks have two options before they only had one option. So before when a bank wanted to generate revenue, they would have to make loans. Of course, there's other talking in broad strokes here, but they would have to make loans to the private sector and the commercial sector. And that would fund investment and business and entrepreneurship and all of that. But after 2009, with the introduction of QE, now banks have the second option, which is why not just loan it to the Fed essentially and get that lower interest rate on those excess reserves instead of making those loans. And because of the risk aversion and additional compliance, you're saying that they're choosing option B much more than option one, which is causing that great silent depression that we've been in since the GFC because those loans are just not being made, which means that business is not being created and that entrepreneur is not being born. Yeah. Um, so banks, let, let's, banks have two sources of liabilities. They can borrow, borrow funds for their, for their headquarters. You know, they can have a bond issuance, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they, um, and, and they receive deposits, um, from, from you and I on the asset side, there are three possibilities. They have reserves with the central bank and they can lend to the government. So they'll have treasury positions and mm -hmm. they can make loans. Bank, and banks are really simple, right? You know, and most of the time they're deciding between lending to the government, lending to, to the house, to the, to the private sector. Yeah. Um, QE is an exogenous event to the bank. So there are parties, um, it's not necessarily the bank. There are uh, parties which are clients of the bank and they choose a liquidity decision, which then changes the liability of the bank as it receives the inflow from the deposit. And then the, the, the uh, concurrently, it will then be credited with a reserve from the central bank with the hope that then it will then look to make loans to the household sector. So it's not that they haven't made loans is that the rate of change, the rate of expansion in those loans is, is way below what we became used to in the kind of 30 years up until 2007, 2008. And so without that form of. A monetary accommodation. To my mind, it's no surprise that the economy is the, the, the long-term growth rate seems to have come in by about a percentage point. We know what's happening with the economy. We've seen interest rates go up dramatically, the fastest pace in history. We make Hugh Hendry head of the Federal Reserve. What are you doing to correct the ship? And what would you be doing differently overall to get the economy back on the run rate that it was pre-GFC? If I was trying to get us out of the this depression, this modern depression, I would seek um, a withholding tax on sovereign purchases of treasuries. Um, I would seek to run bigger deficits, fiscal deficits. I would pray to the Almighty that we could spend that money more wisely. My number one, um, my number one motivation would be to eliminate payroll taxes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make poor folk less poor. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, number two would be to subsidize, uh, investment, onshore investment, um, that, you know, and then I would, I would actually encourage, um, I would probably mandate, um, higher minimum wages. Oh my God, people are going to throw up their hands. You know, yeah. if you're full of shock and all, you're just full of prejudice and you do not under, look at me, you don't understand, uh, economic history. So to wrap this up here, to give our listeners some more stuff to mull on. Where is it fair to say you're expecting some storm clouds and you're expecting the storm to hit here within the next 12 to 18 months or 24 months? Uh, the, this, this, the storm cloud is everywhere except in headline inflation. Yeah. Uh, it's right. everywhere except in uh, the house prices of existing homes 
in America, uh, but it's everywhere. And so um, Europe is now clearly feeling the, the forces of a, a recession that will be confirmed in the quarters ahead. Uh, the U.S. will be last last to enter it. Uh, but yes, all of the data is telling you that we are in the midst of being enveloped by a, a defla another deflationary uh, recession. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a quadrant model for how you would want to allocate assets right now. Would you be fully allocated to that quadrant, those quadrants, I should say, or would you have a position on in tilts and cash and then be looking to average into those stocks and crypto and stuff like that as prices come down? Um, the, the, the joy of the, the kind of quadratic expression or, you know, it's an all, it's Ray Dalio's all weather, you know, not, mm -hmm. I'm not claiming this is anything, not reinventing the wheel. Okay. But, um, let's say I've got a notional portfolio. I've got a million dollars. That's my wealth. You know? outside my house, um, I've got a million dollars of, of capital. Could sit in the bank. Okay. But I'm trying to be active. Um, I would probably have. I mean, I was saying like two hundred thousand dollars. Maybe today I'd be I'd be cutting it back to one hundred fifty thousand, which is to say fifteen percent of my wealth would be invested in Nasdaq. Is it overvalued? Don't care. Is it going up? Yes, that's the only thing I care about. Okay, but it's not a hundred percent. It's fifteen to twenty percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the quadrant, which is fixed income, that's where intellectually, that's where I can see the future, but it's not reflected in the price. And so people would say, "Wow, that's a great opportunity." That's not how I operate. I buy things going up. That's why I would have a commitment to NASDAQ. Uh, mm -hmm. The best thing I can say about the TLTs, TLTs are seven, it's an ETF, it's 17 year plus duration of government securities. So it's very, very sensitive to, to rate mm -hmm. changes. Um, I can't own them. The best I can say is they've gone sideways for the best part of a year, okay? And being, going sideways seems to be a triumph given all the hysteria about inflation, okay? Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I, I come in and I buy call options um, at the money. Like people, I, I, I spend all of my time trying to persuade people off the ledge, you know, buying call options, buying any call or put, right? You're buying something which is fundamentally overvalued. You know, Ken Griffith at Citadel is one of the richest guys in the world. He will end up being the richest. He'll be richer than Elon because he owns a casino. It's called the options market. And every option that is sold, is overvalued and that overvaluation goes to Ken and his buddies. Okay. Mm -hmm. So typically if you're buying a call, you kind of want to sell calls. Do you want to do something? You want to be trying, you've got bad extrinsic. Anyway, I'm getting too, too, too far beyond myself. Um, what I want to say is I bought a lot of time. So I bought an expiry, which is January of 25. I bought it mm -hmm. at the mark at, at the money, if you will, at a hundred. <laughs> Um, and, and I've spent $70,000. Now I've got a million. I've, I put 150,000 into NASDAQ. I've, I've, I've got $70,000. They may go to zero if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. If I, if I hold them all the way, I'm not advocating you'd hold them all the way, but they may go to zero. So, but 70,000, so that's 7% of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then the next quadrant would be real assets. I'd have maybe 50,000 in gold. Mm-hmm. Gold's been kind of at the 2000 level for 11 years. Uh, if it ever convincingly breaks 2000 trades, 2200, I'd add 10%. If it was 2300, I'd add 15. If it was 2400, I'd, you know, et cetera. I don't think, I think gold's capped. Um, gold is already $13 trillion. So um, I struggle to think of it being, I, I can't conceive of gold tripling. If it tripled, it'd be at what, uh, four and a half thousand, mm -hmm. almost 5,000. 5,000, it'd be worth more than all US equities. I find right. that pinch. Um, so I'd have gold, but not a huge amount. I would have like 200,000 200, in Bitcoin. Um, I would, and, and for, this, for, for the inverse reason with gold, uh, gold is presently 26 times the, the market valuation of Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so, which is to say Bitcoin is half a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, if Bitcoin doubled or tripled, doesn't move the needle. And indeed, all of these US institutions are like, wow, this is something we can sell to the poor folk and charge them a fee. And, and it's only half a trillion just now. And maybe one day it'll be 10 trillion. And just think of the money we're going to make. So you've got, uh, you know, the bad guys, the crooks, whatever, in this silly cowboy language that I use, they're incentivized to really get behind it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I have to say, Bitcoin is one of the few asset classes that if it fell, I'd buy more. If it was 20,000, I'd, I'd, buy, I'd buy another 100,000, you know. Mm. Um, and so let's think, let's tally it. We're, so we're getting into the cash segment. So I 150,000 NASDAQ, 70,000 on tail options, that's 220. 200,000 in Bitcoin, so I'm at 420. 50,000 in gold, I've spent 470,000. So I've got 530,000 in dollar cash, baby. I'm getting paid 5%. I might even go into US munis, I'm on 7%. I tell you what I may even do. The NASDAQ, maybe I bought the futures. My broker only asked me to, to post 10,000 bucks. Maybe I, I bought the futures on Bitcoin. I get, so maybe actually I'm sitting and the only thing that's left my account is 70,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting with the best part of a million bucks. I'm up 5%. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if the TLT, which is a, a hundred, if it goes to 110, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy like a hundred thousand, 200,000, 300,000. If NASDAQ starts going down, I'm going to sell. I was only buying it because it was going up. Bitcoin right. goes down. I'm going to buy more of it. So you see, I'm I'm, like, I'm in the game. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't like this year. S and P and Nasdaq are up a, a huge amount. I don't care. Right. I don't buy. I'm not a beta guy. I right? you know I'm an alpha guy. You know. There so. we go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And final question here for you, Hugh. What is one piece of investing wisdom that you know today that you wish you knew when you started off? <sighs> um. It always takes longer. Um, and it's always a lot simpler than they try and tell you. Uh, everyone's on the make. Everyone wants your money. You know? um, they, 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 they conceive of complexity um, to keep you confused. Um, you know, listening to your great show, listening to my, my show, The Asset Capitalist Show, you know, um, I'm not suggesting you go out there and you read every macro book. Like you don't go to a great dentist and then like want to be a dentist, right? You know, you know, a lot a lot of people just think I'm a raving lunatic. That's that you're fine. You're wrong. I, I get to act like a circus clown, but only because I'm like smarter than anyone watching this 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 show. You know, it's my life. I could take you down, right? But you don't have to emulate me. But I'm coming in and, and your other guests and they drop. You know, like. Twitter, you know, you probably got young folk on your show and they probably don't have Twitter. Get Twitter or X or whatever he's calling it now. Like you've got the smartest people in the world and they pay $8 a month or something to actually contribute their wisdom. And you can create a list and every morning, don't read new newspapers are written by industrious but limited people because there's not enough p l in newspapers to afford talent and on twitter you can set you can set a list and you'll have wisdom at the breakfast table so awesome well hugh thank you so much for coming on the show here a pleasure